This is the very first episode of Moonshots. In this episode, we're going to go behind the scene and you're going to be hearing from our executive producer, Mandy, really asking me about what is it that got us to start Moonshot? What is Moonshot and why does someone should, why should someone care about Moonshot? This is going to be a great episode. I'm so excited, Naveen. Thank you for having me. Oh, I thought I was supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I said it for you. Well, I'm I'm the executive producer. You can just expect that from me, right? Um, so I have some questions about Moonshots. When you first came to me and you said, I want to start a podcast and I want to call it Moonshots. Of course, that was really on brand, knowing, you know, going to the moon, knowing your whole story, knowing about your book. Um, but I'm wondering for the listeners of this podcast, if you could explain why you wanted to start a podcast named Moonshots and then what you're going to be you know, discussing on that. Why Why you thought that there was basically a void that needed to be filled in the podcast world um, that, that Moonshots can offer something unique? Well, one of the interesting things is Moonshots is not about me or what I do. The idea of Moonshots is that every one of us has a moonshot in us. We somehow never get to ignite it. And my hope is that we bring in the guest that will actually give you that. You don't have to look like one person or you have to be doing one type of thing, whether it's tech or really going to the moon. Every one of us can go out and do audacious thing that someday could change the lives of millions of people. And if you are able to do that, you have a moonshot. Mm -hmm. So the thing is to listen to that voice inside you. What is it telling you? What is it that you're willing to give up your life for? What is it that makes you jump out of the bed every single day? And that is your moonshot. And I hope everyone listening to this episode and listening to every episode going forward is going to compel them to find their moonshot. I love that, Naveen. You're so inspiring. Every time I hear you, I'm just I can't believe how inspiring you are just with a few sentences. Um, one of the things that I think people are wondering is with this kind of enthusiasm and passion, how, who ignited that in you? Who was the one who showed you your moonshot? Well, it's the amazing thing about life is that that is the biggest mentor you're going to ever find, right? So we always look for this personification of mentorship that, you know, there is a person. To me, the life is the biggest teacher you can ever find because life never stops teaching. It's us who stop learning. So to me, the every day in your life is that teaching movement. And that teaching movement is what's your greatest mentor that's always with you. That means every time you find a difficulty, find the lesson in that difficulty. Every time you are on the top of the mountain, always find yourself to look back where you come from and always be grateful for what you have achieved. And never forget to thank people along the way who brought you there, whether it's a Sherpa who guided you there or it is the willpower that you got to go there. And what were the thoughts that were going through your mind as you were climbing up? And share the thoughts with everybody because you never know who is going to learn from that thought that you shared and is going to climb the next mountain and the next peak and find their own moonshots. Absolutely, Naveen. That's awesome. I love that. So you're talking about using people's, um, using their experiences and their ideas in order to spark your own moonshot. I'm wondering, because I know a little bit about your history, how you kind of started off and you were in poverty when you were a child, and then you came to America, $5 in your pocket, and you worked for Microsoft, I believe it was. Oh, no, much, much later. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, later than that. You worked for Microsoft. And then, but it seems like a progression over time. You just keep reaching for bigger and bigger and bigger moonshots, as you would call them, and you just keep thinking bigger. I'm wondering, because there's a lot of people listening to this podcast um, who are probably in jobs right now who feel like they, they may not be at, even at the Microsoft level where you were. How do they start on the journey to get to thinking big and then progressively thinking bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where it really is like you are going to the moon? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so this is really not about working for a company or working outside the company. It is about dreaming it is about imagining what the world can be. Most of us are limited 
by the fact of what we can imagine. Every time something comes up and our first reaction is, well, that can't be done or it is too difficult or they will never allow that to happen. As opposed to thinking, what is it that I can do to make that happen? What is the thing I can do to make it a possibility? And Instead of looking at the world as is, what if we can start to think of the world what it can be? And if we can describe the world that we want the world to be, not only you can achieve that, you allow to bring everyone else who feels the same way that will join you in that journey to create that world that you think is possible. Okay, so it's about being involved in a moonshot. It's about making a moonshot real. You don't have to be necessarily the person who thought of the moonshot. You just have to be a person who's bringing something into existence that could really change the lives of billions of people. That's right. And is solving a real problem. That's, and that's the only way you can help the lives of billions of people because you're doing something so real. It's not something imaginary. It's not building Alexa-enabled toilets. It is about <laughs> actually solving the problem that people are suffering today because the biggest problems in this world are the biggest opportunity for an entrepreneur to create the moonshot. Right. And so I know that you have started Biome and you've started Moon Express, both audacious goals. And I know that your plate is very full because you're a man who I don't even know how you sleep with all that you do. Um, but I'm wondering, what else do you see out there that are potential moonshots that aren't being basically that aren't being pursued? Sure. What what opportunities are there out there that you see because you're in that mindset already of what giant problems are there that can be solved? Well, I mean, literally, there are many. And it's, even if you solve every one of the things I'm going to talk about today, there are going to be more and more problems because all that happens is we continue to create new problems while we are solving the existing problems. So, for example, today you could argue that there are education that completely needs to be reimagined and reformed. You look at the creating the abundance of food because people wonder that in this limited resource planet that we live in, can we really feed 20 billion people someday? And you start to think, what if we can reimagine agriculture? What if we can redo how we grow the food and can we actually feed 20 billion people? What if the food, like cattle, doesn't have to be really come from the live cattle? So what if the beef can come from synthetic biofactories? You look at the fresh water and you look at the fight that we do have all over the world because of energy. What if we can create abundance of energy? That means not only it will be democratized, it will be demonetized, it will be like air, right? So what if we can create tremendous amount of free abundant energy, free food, free affordable housing? What if we can start to think about the things that we, every single day, the income inequality, gender inequality, every one of these problems I'm talking about impact billions of people every single day. And then you say, if these problems are solved, where the people are no longer suffering from chronic diseases. So imagine a world where no one ever suffers through chronic diseases because they are able to take control of their own health. What would be the problems we'll be solving then? Then we'll be solving the problem about how do we understand someone, what they are thinking without having them speak? Why do we have to speak? Because the amount of words you can get out in a minute, even though I talk so fast, is still <laughs> limited, right? Yeah. But what if? That was not the limitations. What if I can read the mind and what if that could be high bandwidth? Mm -hmm. That will be the problem we'll be solving. Yeah. Someday the next problem we'll be solving is why do we spend years trying to learn something to put in our brain? What if we can upload someone who's already knows those things and actually upload those skills directly into our uh -huh. brain? And that will be the problem we'll be solving. So my point is, as the society is constantly moving forward, we're going to have the new set of problems that are going to help another billion people. Right. So I don't think we're going to ever run out of things to do. Right. What I hear in your voice, and now I'm starting to understand why you're so excited about the things that you do, even the things that seem to solve basic problems, is because you know that those are getting you to a world where we're really solving the problems that you're talking about, where we're starting to solve, okay, we don't need to speak anymore. Okay, we can just upload all of this data onto our brains. We don't need to go to university anymore. That is an exciting world to live in. I think that's one of the things that drives you more than just 
I want to solve health. I want to solve all of these smaller problems or, well, they're bigger, but all of these base problems with their ability to live a good life and to live a meaningful life. Now we can get on to how are we really going to advance humanity and how are we going to live in a completely different society where it's like, you know, Star Trek style. Right. I mean, that's what I'm seeing. Well, so ultimately, you know, you mentioned the Star Trek style. It's not about just Star Trek. Star Trek and other science fictions are gives us the imagination right. of what is possible. And because we all know the only things that we can't do are the things we can't imagine. And right. that's the reason we love the science fiction, because it shows us the possibility when someday when we used to watch Star Trek and Star Wars, and it gives us a thing. Maybe there is a version of tricorder we can create that will diagnose the diseases. Right. Maybe we'll be able to teleport a life. Maybe we'll be able to tell, you know, have it understanding of what people are saying without them having to say telepathy, right? So you could have telepathy, you can have teleporting. And teleporting to some extent is already starting to happen at a basic level. So when you are able to... Uh, sequence a DNA of a bacteria or a virus, and you are able to synthesize on the other end, you literally have transported a life from one place to another place. And that is just the first version of you know teleporting. Ultimately, the teleporting may not have to come physically because the reason we go to a certain place is because we have the sensors in our body that are attached to this human body, right? And that's how we experience the world. So we experience the world through our eyes, through our ears, through our touch, through the smell. But what if these sensors can be anywhere and they are directly connected to your brain and they're feeding as if you are seeing that thing? Your brain doesn't know how that signal came it will see that your eyes are seeing it even though you are not there. And what if your brain can those, get those signals from multiple places at the same time? So when your mother used to say, Mandy, you cannot be two places at the same time, and say, Mom, <laughs> what if that is possible? Wow. <laughs> right? And what if you're able to synthesize the in real time the same information at the same time? That means today I can look here and I look at you and I turn and I look at here, a completely different picture. And what if we there were two from two different cities? What if they were from two different parts of the continent? What if they were part of two different universes altogether? That would really ease up your speaking schedule. I know that. <laughs> yeah, but my point is, even this idea of that you have to be physically there to speak, right? right? The, even the fact that you have to speak, what if you're able to trans upload your knowledge into someone else's right. brain? You don't have to, they don't have to be physically there either. What if everything was in this virtual world where even my brain essentially is interacting with other brains and, and learning and sharing knowledge with each other? And that virtual world is where the brains communicate with each other. And we essentially are just simply a physical manifestation of that yeah. <laughs> consciousness. This is so unbelievably far ahead of what anybody is thinking or can even imagine. Where could people start today? What What is the thing that you see happening in the next 10 to 15 years that could get, let's say, learning even? on a path to that? Because I, I don't even know if we're going in the right direction right now. Sure. So first of all, we're living in this amazing decade in the human history. There has never been a time in the human history where the things are changing at this exponential pace. So you talk about learning. The fact today, they just sage on the stage that teaches you in a certain way. And that certain way you have to adapt how the teacher is teaching. What if that was switched? What if the learning can be done at your own pace with your own adaptation of how you learn and the teacher actually adapts to how you learn? What if you're not learning about skills because the whole idea of skill learning has to go away? And the reason this, you know, is the education system was designed to teach you a skill because those skills could be used in the real time in the world and you could have a, what I would say, a productive job in the mm -hmm. society. 
Now we're living in a world that it doesn't matter what skill you learn, that skill becomes obsolete even by the time you graduate. And that means now it is about learning to learn, learning to solve problems. And what's really amazing is that most problems tend to be multidisciplinary rather than unidisciplinary. So idea of someone learning one skill goes away. It will be multiple discipline you learn and you use those disciplines to solve a problem. And it's about constantly learning. So idea of going to a university one time and then being done actually goes away and you become a lifelong learner. So and this idea that we have discussed in the past, which is really is that Today, the education system is designed to, you know, it's mostly to take you to the water and make you drink mm -hmm. rather than actually making you thirsty. And to me, the real education system will be to create that thirst. And the thirst comes from intellectual curiosity. And what if we can create every human to be intellectually curious? That means every day they're asking the question, not why, not just why it is, but what it can be. So not just simply saying this is what it is and I want to know why. They're asking the second set of question is, what if this did not exist? What else would exist? And why? And how do I get there? So it really becomes about asking the right set of questions, not having the right set of answers. I believe the education system of tomorrow will not be designed around giving you the answers. The education system should be designed to teach you how to ask the right questions, not necessarily have the right answers. And the reason for that is the artificial intelligence can actually Mm -hmm. take data from gazillions of these knowledge bases and come up with an answer, but it can never come up with the right yeah. question, right? So we as humans, what That's if- That's a great point, right? Naveen. The, what if we can ask the right question? And I can give you a couple of examples of the what the right questions are, because, you know, we talked about going to the moon. And you know, anytime you talk about that, how we can actually be able to live on the moon or Mars or beyond, the question people always say is, wait a sec, how is that even possible? Because how are you going to grow the moon, food on the moon? How are you going to grow the food on the Mars? What if that was not the question to ask? What if the right question to ask is, why do we eat food? And when you suddenly change just that question, instead of how do we grow the food to why do we eat the food, if the problem that you're solving a very, very different set yeah. of problems, right? Yeah, that's amazing. I, I love that thinking. I think you're just blowing people away. Oh. And, and this is what I would call moonshots thinking. This is completely unique. And this is the thing that this show is bringing to the world that has not been done before. I've never heard anybody ask these questions before. And coming from a home where both my parents were teachers, I think they would both be inspired and probably re-energized by the way that you're talking about it. Because there is something, we're not trying to download information and then just do tasks, you know, like we're computers, because we have those, right? That's right. If, if we become computers will just be obsolete because they can be better computers than us. AI can. Yes. But but what could we we can never get exponential, you know, thinking or growing or technologies or advancement if we're just repeating tasks as we're told. That's exactly right. You can never ever be a better computer than a computer. Right. But you can be a better human being than a computer. Right. right. Exactly. And that means you have to really start thinking about what makes us human. What are those creative ways that we can use what makes us human and essentially use the computers to do the job that they do the best, right? So this whole idea of, of having knowledge, what if we can make the knowledge as actually being a baggage or a burden, right? Because to me, when you become an expert at something, you actually become more or less useless in that field. And what I mean by that is an expert becomes an incrementalist. That means they can maybe do a job better than other people, 10% better or 15% better. But once you become an expert, you will never able to make that field 10 times better or 100 times mm -hmm. better. Because to be an expert, you have to believe in the foundation 
because that's what makes you an expert. Yeah. But sometimes <laughs> it needs to be disrupted right. in and order I'll, to exponentially, mm -hmm. you know, increase. That's right. And someone who comes along and challenges that foundation is what allows them to make it 10 times better. So I'm seeing how this all strings together now, and especially in your company, Viome, which is trying to solve... Um, solve the healthcare problem and where you came at that with a moonshots thinking. And I, I imagine, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you were thinking instead of all of these companies saying, well, how, how do we have better healthcare? You said, well, why do we get sick? Yes. Or even once you know why do we get sick, the question you have to start asking is continue to dig deeper that we, are we still solving the symptom of that problem or are we actually now mm -hmm. understanding the root cause of the mm -hmm. problem, right? So when you start to think about and saying majority of the people today are suffering from chronic diseases. What mm -hmm. causes chronic diseases? Well, mm -hmm. the chronic diseases are caused by the chronic inflammation. What causes the chronic mm -hmm. inflammation? Well, that is because of the imbalance in your gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. And now that knowledge became more or less what I would say generally understood knowledge. Mm -hmm. And once everybody has that knowledge, then you start to ask yourself and saying, wait a sec, if everybody knows that what's happening in your gut is actually key to understanding the chronic diseases, and there are many, many companies who are actually trying to now understand the microbiome, what are they doing wrong? And that was the actually the question I asked. And I realized that every one of them is focused on solving a problem because the question they asked was, what organisms exist in our gut? Mm -hmm. And that's the problem they tend to solve. Mm -hmm. And I said, that is the wrong question. Because that's useless. That's what you need to know is what they're doing. Exactly the point. And when you start asking that question and saying, I don't need to know who they are. I need to know what they are doing because at the end of the day, the human body only cares what is being right. done. They don't care who is doing it. Right. right? Who, who cares how many of this or that virus you have? You just care what they're doing and what their effect is on you. That's right. So so that then you can regulate what the effects will be. That's right. So that just that set of questions asked differently is what allowed us to create a company that fundamentally is solving a different problem. And now we understand that not only we know what is going on inside the gut, because then now you know how you can modulate that, how you can change that the biochemical activities by using the food as a drug. So imagine in the world, where not only you understand what is going on at a molecular level, but you're using it food as a drug. And we're realizing that each person is different, is unique. Even though our DNA, we look so different, but our DNA still is 99% same. But when it comes to our gut microbiome, it's less than 5% same. Now, that is the reason a one man's food is another man's poison. A same food that can make one person unhealthy is the person at same food that can be actually bring homeostasis in someone else, it can actually heal someone else, right? And we all not only know that all diseases begin in the gut, we also know that one man's food is another man's poison. And food is just not a food. Let food be thy medicine, let thy medicine be the food. And, you know, this is not something we discovered. Right. That's something we knew 2,500 years ago. And this is also what's shocking to me, besides those statements, which, you know, uh, ancient philosophers yeah. said, um, I'm wondering, you know, this is something that this is a technology that our government had at Los Alamos. Yeah. Um Why was this sat on for so long? It just nobody came along with moonshot thinking that that thought in that process. So, you know, in technology in itself is never solves anything, right. right? So, you know, in some sense, the technology is neither good nor evil nor it's action. You know, the thing is, mm -hmm. it is the people who take that and what they do with that. Right. This particular technology that we are using at Wyoming actually came out of the biodefense work at Los Alamos National Lab, where they were obviously, you know, developed this technology for biological uh, defense work if, if there were to be a biological warfare. And we said, if they are able to find out what's making people sick, why can't we take that technology for the good of the humanity and help a billion people not be sick, right? And just the fact that we were able to rethink that problem, we were able to take a technology that could have been applied for a purpose of defense, now bring it to the human health. Right. And and keeping us well instead of destroying things. So more, you know, creation and abundance than destruction. 
Well, it's sometime, you know, the, you know, a lot of the fundamental technologies are developed for uh, creating supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. So we did not go to space because somehow we thought that's what we needed to do. Mm -hmm. We wanted to be a superpower and going to the moon was right. actually in those days was a part of the Cold War to show the Russians that we actually have the better technology right. and we have the higher hill to see what is going on right. <laughs> to some extent. Yeah. So we were on the highest hill to see everything yeah. that was going on and that's why the space technologies were developed. Yeah. And we can now use the laser came out of that and many of the things you see today in the robot and AI actually came out yeah. of the work that was done for space and NASA through NASA. Yeah, I love that. So can you tell me a little bit about Moon Express? Because as we're getting into this space stuff, I know that um, this is another of your moonshots, which is to solve um, renewable energy or uh, clean energy is, is what you're trying to do. Yeah. So, you know, think about when we say, you know, we want to go to the moon and people always say, don't we have enough problems of planet Earth or have we technically screwed yeah. up this planet so much that we have to actually go out and screw yet another planet? Yeah. And the answer is not that we don't have enough problems here and we are trying to somehow abandon this planet. We are actually trying to save not just the planet, but save the human species mm -hmm. as such, right? So when every one of us worries about the climate change and say, I am you know, what do the people say? I am worried about this planet. Mm -hmm. And my answer is, please don't, because this <laughs> planet will be just fine without us, right? Yeah. In fact, if you go back and look at millions of years ago, there were dinosaurs, mm -hmm. and a planet got actually hit by a large asteroid. Mm -hmm. And that wiped out the dinosaur species. Yeah. Planet did just fine. Yep. As a matter of fact, it did so fine, it created humans. Right? Yes. <laughs> right. So imagine if we are able, you know, if we got hit by yet another asteroid, that may completely wipe out the human species. Mm -hmm. Planet will go on to create superhuman for all we right. know. Right. But if we want to save this human species, we have to take the human species to multiple planets. That means we have to distribute ourselves into multiple spacecrafts. So that if one spacecraft gets damaged, our other spacecraft have human species that can reseed this planet. And the second part of it is, when we are living on one planet and living off one planet, that means we are somehow bound by the resources yeah. only on this planet. It's a scarcity, scarcity mindset. Right? We're, we're not living in abundance yet. That's right. And now imagine we say the land is limited. Mm -hmm. How can the land be limited our mind is limited mm -hmm. because our planet, the planet Earth, is nothing but a tiny dot in our own solar system. Mm -hmm. Our solar system is a tiny dot in our galaxy. Mm -hmm. Our galaxy is a tiny dot in universe. And our universe may be a tiny dot in this multiverse, mm -hmm. right? So, now, where is that? Scarcity. Where is that scarcity yeah, of land? <laughs> there's literally no scarcity. There's actually planets out there made of diamond. And, and we have this false scarcity about even that. So my point is we can, the only reason we believe the land is limited because we believe system says we can only live here. Mm -hmm. But what if we could live anywhere else? Would that still be yeah. limited, right? Yeah. And you can start to see the same thing. The energy, we fight over energy because we believe it is limited. Yeah. Every 90 minutes, more solar energy falls on this planet than we actually use in the whole year. Simply a matter of conversion, and that too shall come, that we'll be able to convert the photo cells, uh, photons uh, from solar energy into a reusable energy. No different than what happened to the aluminum being so rare and so expensive because it was so hard to extract from bauxite. And the technology called electrolysis came about that made it abundant and almost free. Right? What will be the electrolysis of the solar energy that will make the solar energy abundant and free? But the interesting thing is that is just one way of doing it. Now, imagine if we can get helium-3, which is absolutely rare on planet Earth, but it's abundant on outside planet what Earth. What is helium-3? Helium-3 is an isotope of helium that can be used for fusion energy in a very clean energy way. That means that 
the waste or the byproduct of fusion or byproduct of helium-3 is non-radioactive. Ah. That means we are now able to bring a small quantity of helium-3 from the moon or beyond and then use that for fusion reactors on planet Earth. And we'll be able to power this planet for generations to come with a very small quantity of helium-3. Now, people who are listening to it, they probably are wondering, did he say fusion? Is he really does not know that? Does he really not know that there is no fusion right now? And the answer is, yeah, but we don't have helium-3 either, right? Yeah. But the point is, we know in the next 10 years, we're going to have a fusion reactors. And when we have a fusion reactors, what are they going to be asking for? Does someone have helium-3? Mm -hmm. And that's the time you have to be ready for that 10 years. That mm -hmm. means you as an entrepreneur have to go where the soccer ball is going to be or where the puck is going to be, not where the puck is, right? Right. And that means you have to be constant thinking about what is going to come next and be ready for that next revolution. And that is what I would call a moonshot. I would call that a moonshot for sure in the in the simplest sense of the word. Absolutely. Naveen, I am more excited than I have than I was to begin with about this podcast and what it's going to bring to the world. I am hoping that there are more entrepreneurs out there and just people even working in companies that adopt this moonshot mentality and go out there and solve these problems that we're talking about because I just want to duplicate you and I think the world will be good. Well, I'll tell you what, it is not about me at all. Remember, what makes me... It's your me, mindset, but it's so I, rare. But my hope is that people who are listening to this or people who are watching this I want them to start thinking. You don't have to follow what I do. You just have to think like I do. And I want to share all that with you every single week on every episode of how you can think about the problem differently, how you can go out and be the problem solver, how you can find your own moonshot and not just find your moonshot, you're able to go out and execute on your moonshot. And my hope is you'll join me every week with these amazing people who are gonna tell you about their moonshot, how they found, how they discovered their moonshot, how they go about solving their moonshot. And I hope every episode will give you that inspiration, that nugget of knowledge that you'll be able to go out and do something absolutely amazing. So go out and dream big. Dream so big that people think you're absolutely crazy and never ever give up because you can only fail when you give up. Other than that, just go out and enjoy and stay inspired.